Um, and so that's kind of how I feel about that. I get really annoyed when people think that um, those coaches started, like, like ruined what we had with, with this unicorn run here. It's just so far from the truth. I understand why people could think that from the outside, but it's just ridiculously untrue and, and really annoys me. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how it all went down. And then... Guys, welcome back to the Imported Podcast with me, Nick Alfieri, aka Nauf. It is a gloomy Sunday here in Schwabisch Hall, Germany, and uh, I'm just chilling. This is a solo podcast. I mentioned it uh, a couple times ago that every once in a while I'm going to do solo podcasts as well. Usually I've got a guest sitting right here, but today I have no guests. It's going to be me rambling about things. I did put out on Instagram. I asked if you had any questions or topics you would like me to talk about, and some of you guys submitted some stuff, and I will be talking about those today. Ah, nice cup of coffee. I started doing French press coffee. It's so much better than uh, the previous coffee that I had. Okay, guys. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. I really, I'm kind of excited about this YouTube channel, about the, the Imported YouTube channel um, with, you know, the football content and talking about football stuff. But also, I don't want it to just be football stuff. I'm going to slowly branch out into other aspects of life. Um, you know, just kind of being a human. So I'm also going to get some guests soon that are not football related. Um, a few people that I've been talking to that I think could be pretty cool. So yeah, this is, uh, you know, start off a little football related and we'll of course always have football stuff because I'm very interested in that, but also I'm interested in other things and I don't want to just lock myself into one topic on this podcast. So it'll be all sorts of stuff. Um, but of course still football content too. And um, if you're bored already and want to click off this, don't don't do me a favor. Don't click off this. Just put it on mute and let it run in the background, because then it will recommend it to other people and it'll help broad out broaden out the reach of this YouTube channel. I'm trying to get this channel to a thousand subscribers, um, and we're at like six hundred and something. So you're probably bored already. Just don't don't click off, click off. Put me on mute and let it play all the way out. You're doing me a big favor. All right, guys. Now, if you're not bored, let's get into the stuff that you guys sent for me on Instagram. Oh, yeah. Oh, I woke up to a bunch of snow outside on the balcony. Okay, we're going to go in order of... Wait, is this... Okay. <laughs> Gosh. We have some, um, well, let's say wildly inappropriate questions or comments. Um, first one, of course, from Javier, my good friend from Spain, who now lives in Trebuchet Hall. Your, your question's not going to be answered, Javi, you monster. <laughs> Zach Anktel, yeah, okay. <laughs> That's funny. Here we go. Where's your brother, Mikey? Uh, and what are his plans? Is he living in Germany or back in the U.S.? Mikey is back in the U.S. He is pursuing some American football options in the United States right now. Uh, he did have a bunch of opportunities to come back out to Europe, um, but decided not to at this time. But who knows? Some of these teams still want him and, and said that he could come out later in the year. So... We will see, but right now, yeah, he's in the United States. Mikey didn't love Germany as much as I do. Um, Mikey's not a, he's not such a, a European a European lifestyle fella. Uh, he liked Italy a lot better than Germany, I would say, and his personality fits Italy a little bit more than it does Germany, and uh, so we'll see. If he comes back to Europe, I would imagine he would go to Italy. What non-work-related thing are you passionate about right now? Wow, that's a really good question. It's so weird because my passion and my work are so intertwined and blended. So it's like my passion 
my two biggest passions have been football and filmmaking, and those have both been also my work for my adult life. Um, non-work, reading, I would say reading is my, outside of working on video stuff and content and filmmaking and working out, um, I would say reading is a big passion of mine and also being in the mountains, hiking, any sort of mountain activity. Uh, I'm quite passionate about that. Let's see, any other activities outside of work? Do I do? Yeah. I spend a lot of hours making videos and uh, films and, and content. I spend a lot of my time doing that. But it's like sometimes it feels like work, but oftentimes it feels exciting and fun. So it's... It's kind of strange. You know who I heard talk about this was Ed Sheeran because his passion is obviously making music and his work is also making music and he goes on tour and he's playing his guitar and singing on stage and he's doing this for months at a time and this is his work. Of course, he loves it, but it's also his work. But then when he took like a year off of all of this, he's like, I didn't really know what to do in my free time because what do I like to do in my free time? Make music and play the guitar and sing. So he said, though, that it actually helped him kind of reset, and he started picking up a guitar and playing it for fun, not with the idea of, I'm writing a song for an album, this is going to make me money and help me make my living, but I'm playing this simply for the pleasure of it, and it sort of helped him re-fall in love with his passion that he that he's had. And I've sort of had that as well, because I had to make like some breaks from filmmaking or making YouTube videos, but then I just kind of give myself a little bit of freedom to create something that I don't think, okay, this has to be part of my job. That's actually kind of why I started this podcast because I love making stuff and I wanted to make something that was strictly passion driven and not something that I'm like, okay, this is going to be part of my job. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I just went off on a tangent there. That's a good question. But in short, Still making videos that are outside of the work world for me. Reading, being in the mountains. Good question. What's your favorite German baked good besides a pretzel? I always get a pretzel. Hmm. Probably a Laugenstange, but these ones in Innsbruck that have cream cheese and chives on them. I guess that's Austrian. In general, probably a Laugenstange though. But not as good as a pretzel. What was the best experience with the blue team? The blue team is the Italian national team for American football. We are team blue. This is from Ale. Um, I would say we had this camp in La Spezia on the west coast of Italy at a military base. And we were there for a week and got there. It's just no Wi-Fi. You're sleeping in these Big boarding style rooms with eight guys to a room with just little twin beds, and they're all so squeaky. And you've got two football practices a day. You're working all day on football, and on paper, it's kind of like for me, just uh, ooh, this is a little bit miserable. I have no freedom, but it turned out to be one of my favorite experiences, not just with the blue team, but with football in general. The team bonding and the bonding with those guys at that camp was so cool, and. Um, it's such a, I don't know, such a fun memory to look back on. I did make a YouTube video about it. Uh, I can't remember what it's called. It's from two, the summer of 2021. Um, but I would say that has been my favorite one. And just hanging out with those guys on the Italian team has been awesome. What is something you're challenged by now that your main job isn't football anymore? Also a very good question. Um, The built-in camaraderie and brotherhood and the the good feelings of being on a team, this is something that I don't have right now, so I have to be very intentional and and carve out times and make efforts to cultivate my relationships and hang out with people because previously I had football practice and football games. This is built into my life. No matter what else I have going on, I'm going to see these guys on on Wednesday and Friday and Saturday, and we're going to 
do play football together and have all these experiences together. Now that that's not an automatic in my life, having to structure that in and be consciously, oh, I haven't seen anybody for four days. I've just been working. I need to go hang out with somebody. Um, this is probably one of the biggest difficulties I would say. And then also having, there's the, the structure of a football season is you have like kind of these micro goals that you're striving towards, which is games every weekend. So every Saturday I've got like an overarching goal and something that I'm aiming to. And then also on top of that, an overarching macro goal over the course of the season, which is the championship. So to have these little like kind of, um, check marks along the way, checkpoints where you're like, you know, you're working in the week to hit this goal. And then that helps you build upon you're getting to this goal. And it's kind of like a stepping ladder or, or stepping stair all the way to a big macro goal. And to have that built into your life helps trickle that into other aspects of my life. I'm thinking the same way of like, okay, I've got a football game this week and I'm also making a YouTube video or two YouTube videos and to sort of have this structure built in. Uh, this is something that I have to now make a conscious effort to do. Whereas in the past it was just built in and automatic for me. <laughs> hmm. This is fun. Very fun. Uh... Oh man, this is all a mess. Okay. How do I... Ever thought about looking for a job in football after being a football player? Very good question. Yes, I am currently doing that. I would like, I am in talks, finalizing talks of getting at least some, um, some elements of work within the football world and it will combine my football and filmmaking passions. And so absolutely. A lot of times people become coaches after they play, but I don't know, this doesn't really seem like my personality. I would love to be around football but in like the media aspect and the marketing aspect of football, while still kind of getting the vibe of feeling like I'm a part of a team, um, that would be what I would be doing. <laughs> okay, biggest change for you mentally and emotionally since retiring from, from football? I kind of kind of touched on that. It's the, it's the structures that are built into your life automatically. And then the friendships and camaraderie that is also built into your life. And so having to make a conscious effort to pursue these things has been so far the biggest challenge mentally and emotionally since retiring from football. Do you as an American, do you as an American, American football player support a soccer team? I do not support any soccer teams. However, I'm sort of mildly interested in soccer culturally uh, or just as a sport on a large scale, because it's really interesting how so much of the world is so into it. And I'm interested in kind of, <sighs> yeah, no, I don't have a, I don't have a team that I would pick. I would probably, if I had to pick like a, I would probably pick a German team. That wouldn't be bad if I said like Bayern Munich, because um, they're kind of like the, the, the posh, Oh, we're better than everybody egocentric team, but they have been pretty good. I won't say that I'm a fan of them. Although I, I do love Bavaria and I do love Munich, but <clears throat> sort of soccer team I like. No, I don't think I got a good one. A friend of mine is a big fan of you. Will she be able to see you at a unicorns home game? Yeah, I'll probably be at a, at least a handful of unicorns home games this year. So that is very much a possibility. And I do live in Trebuchet Hall still. How long do you play football for? I played football. I first started playing organized football in seventh grade, which I think then I was 12 years old, I believe. 14, you're in high school. 13, you turned into, yeah, 12. I think I was 12. I wanted to play much earlier, but my parents wanted me to play other sports first. And I think that was actually really smart to... <clears throat> Not start off right away with football, but to play soccer and basketball and track and like learn all the movements of your body. And this is, uh, I think, very helpful for a, a developing athlete. There's also like a theory 
because apparently there's been a huge rise in, you know, young athletes with ACL tears, like the most significant uh, Kreuzband, which in, in German, the Kreuzband tear or ACL tear, which is like the largest l- ligament, right, in your leg. Super serious. But there's been a lot more of them in recent years, and some people have attributed to that. I don't know if it's like actually studied or if it's a theory hypothesis of that this is due to the fact that more and more children are specializing in sports early on. So instead of playing four sports, a different sport each season, they're becoming a soccer player at age eight. That's all they play. They play in like a league in the fall, and then they play on their club team year round, and they're only playing soccer year round. And so they're not developing in the same way different muscles and different movements that they would if they played other sports. And that, you know, if you play soccer in the fall and basketball in the winter and track in the spring, your body's getting used to different movements and developing different muscles and stuff. And perhaps this helps protect against some of these major tears that um, young athletes seem to be having. So I'm kind of happy about that because knock on wood, I never had um, a major tear like that. Uh, I did, did tear my MCL when I was older, but that was due to a direct blow because the, Oh yeah. I forgot to mention the rise is in non-contact ACL injuries. So it's just that, People are tearing their ACL when they plant themselves and cut themselves. It's not like they got hit, uh, and that's the theory behind it. So, wow, I got on that rant from somebody asking how long I played football. So from age 12 to age 30, but when I was 23, I did not play football um, the year after I finished college, university, my bachelor's degree, because I went to film school and wasn't playing football that fall. What are your brothers up to? Anthony is living in California, San Luis Obispo, living down there, working down there, doing a lot of different things. Joey has been invited to the USFL, United United States Football League, um, with the Philadelphia Stars, and he is going there soon and will be entering back in the football world. Mikey is at home preparing for some football opportunities in the States as well. And Andy is at California Berkeley playing football there and finishing up his degree at Cal Berkeley. And uh, my sister just had a baby, my nephew. I love that guy. And that's what's going on with the Alfieri children. And me here sitting doing a solo podcast in my apartment in Germany. Did I mess this up? Okay, wait. Art versus science from James Edward Slack, my good friend. He was a guest on the podcast, Jimmy Slees, and my teammate with the unicorns. And we always have this debate. What's more important to humanity, art or science? Jim always said science, and I think I always said art, although we both recognize the value of each. And then I would always go, I would always quote the quote from... Robin Williams and Dead Poets Society, which I'm going to butcher now, but it's like something like engineering, law, mathematics. These are all important disciplines. And these are how people run society and function in life. But art, music, film, poetry, writing, these are all important disciplines because they are why a human being lives and functions in society. I'm going to go ahead and say, actually, that art and science are equally important. Sort of like a yin-yang, I would say. Jim. That's what I'm going to say for my good friend James Slack. And maybe my answer will change in a year. I don't know. I don't know, because I feel like I used to say something different. It's so weird how as you live through life and you learn new things and meet new people, your perspectives change. Right now I'm saying our favorite disciplines are equally as important, my friend James Slack. And I miss y'all. And I just realized I have to text you back. I'll text you back after this. 
How long do you play football? What do you buy? Okay. How do you see the new development of the AFD board? That is the German Football League board. They have re- they have had. How do, how do I say this without like getting in trouble or getting sued or something? They had who I believe to be a malicious. I won't say incompetent. I would just say malicious person at the top who is using football in Germany to benefit themselves and not the sport. Uh, that person, I believe, is out now, which is a very, very good first step um, and something that's absolutely needed to happen. And so hopefully the restructuring of the board there uh, can get some some more uh, people with pure intentions at the top who will do a good job for football in Germany. Um, an interesting thing about this is like you know, the, the ELF and the GFL boards or the leaderships finally met. And one of the big, um, ah, you know what? I'm not going to get into that just yet. I need to articulate my thoughts a little bit better. Sometimes it's better to, you know, yeah. Oh, wait. (laughs) I heard you used to be an all-star hurdler in high school. Teach us about that hidden side of now. This is from Ryan Cope. He was, uh, he was a friend and track teammate and football teammate at Jesuit High School in Oregon. He was, I think he's two years younger than me. And I, in track, went over and started doing the hurdles. And I was like, I showed some promise early on. And they put me up on varsity. And I was supposed to be like the next hurdler at Jesuit. And like, I really kind of plateaued. And then, and then Ryan Cope came in as a freshman, a first year, and just blew past me immediately. He was like super gifted at hurdling, like really, really good hurdler. And so where I was for a moment there, the, the next hurdler at Jesuit high school, I think it was for about two weeks. And then Ryan Cope came in and just, whoosh, just surpassed me and became, pro- I think one of the best hurdlers in the state. And that is the little story of my glory of being a hurdler, a hurdle star. <laughs> Thanks Cope. <laughs> Ryan Cope was also a great kicker for our football team. Okay. What is Mikey doing? Yep. What I said, preparing for some football stuff. You realize that it's going to be very hot living in that apart- roof apartment in the summer, don't you? I do. I am a little bit scared about that. However, I was just talking to Laura about it because it's pretty cold outside and it doesn't get so cold in this apartment, meaning that this is probably decently insulated. I don't know if I'm just in denial and holding out hope that it's going to be okay, but um, I don't know. We'll see once it starts to get hot, and if so, I will be willing to spend money this year to get a some sort of portable air conditioner because um, I'm looking around here and just thinking about how all the heat's just going to rise on up to me, and I'm not that excited about that, so... We will see. <laughs> you got some um, very controversial topics from Jacob Johnson or Jakob Johnson for you, um, for you Germans. Him and I have been in, in contact about some possible projects. And uh, he has uh, given me some funny um, topics that I am not going to talk about because I don't want to get myself in trouble. Uh, Just kidding. Give us an outlook on this year in the ELF. Okay, there we go. That's more like it. Thanks, Jacob or Jakob. Um, I am very excited about this year for the ELF. Really excited. Uh, I love what how the league is looking and what it's doing. As you guys know, I've got a lot of um, good friends in a good handful of ELF teams right now. People that I played with or against or were coached by that are involved in ELF teams. And uh, I've been around the Stuttgart Surge a bit. They've invited me to some practices, and I've like filmed some stuff for them, which has been really cool. And um, I don't know. I'm very curious to see how the league shapes up this year. It's cool to see all of the off-season kind of, uh, transactions, basically, of players moving from different teams. It's it's almost like NFL off-season drama, where you're seeing players go from one team to rival teams or packages of players go to different teams. And I I truly think the Stuttgart Surge are probably one of the most exciting teams 
or the exciting, the most exciting story this year because they were so bad in the previous years and they had no wins last year and were, they were like the worst team. And now they've invested and they've got, in my opinion, the best coach in Europe and the best coaching staff in Europe. Disclaimer, I did play for them uh, for a few years and I know them personally. However, I believe that they are um, the elite coaches in Europe. And I think a lot of other people think that too, which is why also they've been able to put together such a great roster. I mean, you see the roster that they've got, the players that they have and that are, are bringing in both Americans and European imports and then homegrown German guys. And so I'm super curious to see how the surge uh, perform this year. I think, of course, they'll be much better than last year. But I'm wondering, like, are the Surge going to be at the top of the league? Are they going to go from 0-12 to top of the league contenders? I seem to think so. I don't want to have to eat my words, but I'm excited about the Surge's uh, potential this year. And then some other teams, I don't know, I just think it's so cool but like, for example, like I know the Stuttgart Surge are playing, they're playing away games in Paris, in Barcelona, in Munich, in Zurich, in Innsbruck. It's like, this is pretty cool that these are where your away games are going to be. And it's sort of a European wide league or, and expanding itself out. Um, smart that they decided to put the championship game up in the, in the um, Cologne um, Dusseldorf region where the population is much larger, smart about that. And I think, and I've said it in the past, the league is um, masterful with their social media presence. And I think that's exactly what, what football in Europe needed because there is good football in Germany and Europe, but it has not been packaged properly and presented properly. And now that's exactly what the ELF is doing. Uh, I mean, a lot of like, it is so important how you communicate with your, your customers, the fans. And if you don't present things well, it, it, is, it communicates something totally different and people perceive it to be a, a different product than it actually is. And so that's what I'm excited about. Can you get Christian McCaffrey on the podcast in his off season? Unicorn Town slash 49ers, etc. Hmm. Maybe, maybe we will get uh, a nice podcast with the man, Christian McCaffrey. That remains to be seen. <laughs> Matt Fay, your BMI, Matt Fay, M-Flow, my best friend from growing up. I was the best man at his wedding. What's my BMI? I don't know, maybe about 10 or so, 10% body fat, I would guess. Hopefully, I could be around 10. I think that's good. Your OCD. <laughs> Not as bad as yours, Matt. Matt and I both suffer from, uh, I don't know if I would call it crippling OCD, but we both had phases at times growing up where we had crippling OCD. Mine was very hand washy. Um, and like, I think that so many young, young kids and young boys have OCD. Matt and I both had it really bad and st I still have remnants of it. I mean, you guys have seen my hands, but it used to be like, I could never, I, I would always have to turn left. And actually, I still have that. If I'm coming to like a pole or something and I can go either right or left, I have to always go left around it. I don't know why. I don't know what that is. Um, so that's a little bit of remnants. Matt had horrible OCD also. When I'd come pick him up uh, for us to go work out or hang out or do something, he'd come to the car and you run back to his house, check that he locked it, run back to the car and be like, oh, wait, I got to check. Run back, check that he locked it, come back to my car, boom, back. And he'd do that, I don't know, seven times. And so... Yeah, Matt and I, we, you know, we really bonded over our OCD. Your BF, I'm guessing this means best friend. Of course, Matthew Fay is my best friend. We became, we used to be arch enemies, actually, because he went to a rival school and we would play against each other in basketball. And him and I were kind of both the best basketball players on our school teams. He came from a big family, seven kids, six, six boys, one girl. I came from a big family, six kids, five boys, one girl. So we were arch rivals. And then in seventh grade, we became, we were on the same football team because it was like every Catholic school in the area had enough kids that wanted to play basketball that they could all field their own basketball teams. But 
there wasn't enough kids that were playing football. So not each t- school could field their own football team. So you pooled schools together. Three or four schools would make one football team. And so we grew up playing basketball against each other. But when it came time to play football, our schools were in the pool together and we were on the same football team, the Beaverton Knights, Region 6. And uh, that's where we became best friends. He was quarterback. I was wide receiver. And fun fact, Matt needed glasses, and he actually had glasses, but he wouldn't wear them to the games. I don't know why he didn't want to wear them to the games. And my dad was a coach, and I was a wide receiver, and Matt was always missing me on some deep balls because he wouldn't wear his glasses. And so one time we had to we had to send um, Matt's parents home to get his glasses so he could wear them in the game. But that's the story of me and Matt growing up, OCD, playing football. Do you want to learn Italian one day? Could be interesting as a new language project. I would love to learn Italian one day. Um, I, I need to because I'm an Italian citizen. I'm on the Italian national team. I won the European Championship with Team Italy. Um, that is something that I will certainly at some point start pursuing. I actually started doing a little bit with that Clio app, free plug for Clio. Um, and I started a little bit, but yeah, that's certainly on my list of my long list of things to do. Thoughts about coaches and players leaving to the surge and generally about the ELF. Yeah. This has been kind of a hot topic in the Schwabish hall area and everything. And I feel like there's a lot of misconceptions, um, and improper thinking about this whole situation. Um, We all knew about the ELF kind of picking up steam in 2021 and 2022. And actually, the, the, the GFL had stagnated so much because of poor leadership and, um, yeah, bad decisions. So the GFL had stagnated. And the ELF was coming up. Of course, at the beginning, we were all very skeptical of it. Oh, new league coming around. Oh, that's not going to last. And of course, I don't really know like the long-term security of that. But right now, it looks very cool and good. And there's a lot of exciting stuff going on there. Um, but people felt that. And you know, we had a big group of guys, coaches and players, that really sort of came around the same time I came, 2014, 15, 16, to, to the Unicorns. A lot of us guys came there, and there was this really distinct, clear period that I will call a dynasty uh, of lots of the same players, a lot of the same coaches, the imports, the German guys. And so we had kind of this run, and it was like everything good, coming to an end, of course, because a lot of guys were getting old, want to retire. Guys, you know, were making so much, so many sacrifices to even play on the team, driving two and a half hours and stuff. And many people were getting ready to either retire or be done um, in 2021. But we, all, we lost the German Bolt to Dresden in kind of a heartbreaking way. We made a lot of mistakes, and um, it was just really a bad taste in our mouth. And so everyone, myself included, was kind of like, oh. And Cody, it's like, oh, man, we can't retire now. Oh, I can't go out like that. Nah. And so we all were like, all right, one more year. Let's one more year. Let's win. Let's get this third German Bowl championship that kind of seals out our dynasty and our our time um, in this unicorn town time period. And so that's why everyone decided to come back for one more year. And so um, it was kind of predetermined early on in the year that everyone knew this was the last year of this run. And our coaches knew that as well. So they knew even if those coaches stayed with the unicorns, the team would look a lot different in 2023. A lot of people were retiring or going to different teams. Um, And so actually people, I feel like a lot of people think the coaches left and a bunch of players followed them uh, is actually not really true. Um, The players were going to leave and some coaches were going to retire. And the coaches saw the writing on the wall as well. And... They figured, okay, well, everyone, it's it's, uh, been an awesome run, and it's time for a new challenge for a lot of these guys or a new chapter of life. Maybe it is for us too. And so uh, I feel like a lot of people think that the the coaches like Jordan and Johnny and Cody left the Unicorns and a bunch of players just left because of that, uh, which is just not true at all. So many players were were done anyway. And so 
I would actually say it would be the opposite. One of the main factors for the coaches going was knowing that, okay, this is over. This run is over. Um, And so that's kind of how I feel about that. I get really annoyed when people think that um, those coaches started like like ruined what we had with with this unicorn run here it's just so far from the truth i understand why people could think that from the outside but it's just ridiculously untrue and and really annoys me um so yeah that's kind of how it all went down and then players decided that they a lot of players knew in this these last few years they wanted to try out the elf because you could see so many players moving from GFL teams or other leagues to the ELF and it seems to have the highest competition now and so these guys that are competitive players wanted to follow that so um, there's probably like four four or five guys that went to the Frankfurt Galaxy four or five that went to the uh, Munich Ravens three or three or four unicorns that went to the the Zurich team in the ELF and then, of course, the closest team to Schreiber Hall, maybe like 10, 10 unicorn guys went to the Stuttgart Surge. And so, yeah, that's kind of, kind of how it went down. So it was really, it was, the writing was on the wall for a couple of years, and the GFL's refusal to acknowledge the ELF for a while also played into that. And kind of just said, guys were just like, all right, if you're not going to make any efforts to make the league more competitive or more professional or anything, then, I mean, what choice do you leave us? And so that's kind of why a lot of people migrated to different locations. Um, And that's sort of my thoughts on uh, people leaving. And I would say I feel so happy for that chapter that we had with all these guys but these coaches that I had and these teammates that I had, all these great guys who did so much and sacrificed so much uh, for the team. And, um, yeah, I feel like I, I'm happy to be a part of that. And uh, what a great experience. And a, a chapter of Unicorns football and my own football life that I will cherish forever. So those are my thoughts on that what do you think about privacy in eu slash germany and in the usa and human rights wow that's a little bit heavy um i think that people in germany are really value privacy on one hand but on the other hand are very nosy. It's a weird combination. I call it the privacy paradox in Germany. It's a weird combination. Um, Because in the United States, there's so much more of a... I feel like people care less about their... For example, like in Germany, Google's Maps Street View is totally blurred throughout most of the country. It's like they have the word blurmany. The nickname Blurmany because Germany is blurred in Google Maps. Like in the United States, Street View. That is not the case. People are like, yeah, I don't care. Show show the Google Maps. Show the houses on the internet what, what's going to happen. Um, but I also feel like people in the United States, so they have this less, like a more lackadaisical take on, on this type of privacy. But then people also aren't as nosy or telling people what to do or reporting people for things in the United States, whereas you know, like people in Germany really value their privacy, but then also value telling people what to do or getting in people's business, or if they see somebody doing something they don't like, like putting you know the wrong garbage can out or something, then they call the authorities. So it's a weird paradox. It's a very weird paradox. I've, I've made a video about this, and I will continue to make a video about it. I, I have had some frustrating experiences um, with privacy in Germany because I, I find it to not be... Is the word consistent? I don't know. Yeah, I, I find it to be inconsistent, the privacy values. That's, the, that's what I'll say inconsistent privacy values that I can't really make sense of. And there will be a full YouTube video about this on my NALF channel. (laughs) 
When was the first time you ate a peach? This is from my great friend, Brian McKitty, a.k.a. Bruno, because he was, the first time I ate a peach was in 2016 on the steps of St. Michael's Church right over there with Bruno before our Schreiberschall Unicorns game. Uh, Bruno made me eat a peach. You know, I had never really eaten fruits or vegetables for that matter. And Bruno started making me eat some fruits and vegetables on Saturday mornings before our football games. And you know what? I actually don't really eat them that much anymore, but I don't hate them. So, Brune, if we hang out, I'll eat a peach. What what is your favorite non-mainstream movie? Bruno and I did, um, when he we lived together in 2017, Bruno and I would do movie nights. And we would um, basically had a movie club. And we would watch, like, under-the-radar movies. There's one movie that Bruno and I both really loved. And it was super low budget, super under the radar. And I would like, man, what was it? Hold on. What is it called? That Bru- uh, let's see. Oh, no, not sci-fi. It's like. Is it the, I'm Googling it here. Ugh, every time I Google something, I have to <laughs> verify that I am a human. It's probably because I always have a VPN on. These aren't traffic lights, are they? Okay. Jeez. How many can a guy verify? Click the ones that have a motorcycle. Jeez, man. Okay, I'm not going to do that. Is it the uninvited? What is it? Is it the invitation? Sci-fi, it's like there's a cult sci-fi movie. No, cult movie takes place at a house in L.A. No, no, no. Man, what is that? Sci-fi movie takes place at a house. Time travel. What is it? It's super... No, it's not primer. Coherence. Coherence is the movie. Um, Bruno and I really liked that. It was very low budget, but very cool, independent, non-mainstream movie. Uh, and it was very, very good. Ever heard of Gaelic football? I have heard of Gaelic football, but I, I don't think I've ever seen it played. I wonder if I would uh, enjoy that. When was the last time you lioned out? Also from Bruno. To lion out, we, Bruno and I in 2017, along with Raheem, Devin, and Marco, our quarterback, is when we first won the German Bowl, we did this meditation at the hotel the, before the game. And it, the uh, meditation puts you in the mind of a lion. And we did that, and we all played great, and we're so locked in. And so to lion out is to do this meditation. The last time I did that, Bruno, was before the European Championship game, which we won... AFI says Surge City Doc. Oh, interesting. That would actually be a pretty good name for a, a doc about them. Surge City. Every documentary that I make is just going to have some sort of variation of town or village or state or country. <laughs> Was it weird being in the sauna with your brother? Nope, because we both wore towels because we're prude Americans. You now have chapters, timelines under your videos. When did you start this? I started this. I don't really know when I started this. In the last year, I think. Or maybe, yeah. When I do longer videos, I like to put chapter markers because it's better for the audience. Like if you get bored in one section, 
instead of clicking out the video, you, you'll move forward to the next chapter and see if there's something um, that interests you. So I started doing that about a year ago, and I'm starting to do them on these podcasts as well because not many people want to sit and listen to the whole podcast, but maybe there's segments and stuff that you would like to listen to. And so that is when I, why I started doing that. What types of import players thrive slash struggle in Europe? Open-minded, dual threat, et cetera. That's a great question because playing America, being an American import in Europe is a super specific thing. Like teams here recruit players who had success in college, but are not making it to the NFL for whatever reason. Maybe they don't have the right size or just tech, like weren't fast enough or didn't have the proper skill set, but we're close. Um, and so one, you've got to be a good football player, but interestingly enough, a lot of times players who went to the top level division one, a big, um, power five conferences, they do not do well out here in Europe. And that's because they are, you get so spoiled at those schools. You're used to such a high level of comfort in the, in terms of the facilities that you have and the access to meals and food and you're flying on private jets with the teams and uh, not private jets, charter jets um, and everything's luxurious. And then when you come out to Europe, this is not big money football. And so they're like, what the hell is this? No, where's wait, we're, we're bussing to a game on the day of the game. And so a lot of times players from these large schools, even though they're elite on the football field, do not do well out here. And sometimes there's ego problems as well because you you have to be a good football player, but you also have to be so open-minded and adaptable and be willing. Also, you, you don't want to come over here. And this is another problem. Americans coming over here and they're getting coached at practice and they don't listen to the coaching. They're like, no, nah, that's not what I learned in college. No, this is how we do it. I'm not doing it that way, coach. That's stupid. I know more than you. And this kind of attitude helps no one. Um, and just creates problems within the team. And of course, also as an import, you need to be accepted by your homegrown teammates, like the German guys in your team. Um, you need to have good team chemistry. And so you need to, you, you need to be able to fit in with your, your teammates and not have a huge ego and think, Oh, I played at college, so I'm better. And I know more than everyone. I came out here and I learned more about football and got better at football playing in Germany at the, the, than I did in college. And the, I feel like I had, it. of course, I had really good coaches, but I also had an open mind and didn't come out here thinking, I know everything about football because I didn't and I don't. But um, I was just a tort- sort of open for everything. So I would say you've got to be a good football player, but even more important than that, you've got to be open-minded and adaptable and understand that there's going to be major differences from playing in college than playing in Europe. Then I would say just being kind of excited and open to the world because you could come out here and you have practiced two times a week in a game on Saturday and you just sit in your room the whole time and the only thing you do is go to the football practices and work out and that's it. And you don't make the most of the experience. And I think these guys sort of resent the experience. They're like, yeah, I played football in Germany, but it kind of sucked. I mean, I didn't do anything. It's like, man, get on a train and you could travel around so much and experience so much. I would say people that do that and really get the whole experience and get a fulfilling experience – it's that much better and it makes you like the experience more and it makes every, it's like a domino that just makes everything kind of glossy and, and makes it a positive experience on the field and off the field. Um, yeah, that's what I'd say. And oftentimes like recruiting guys from smaller schools sometimes helps because these guys are not used to such crazy luxuries that power five division one guys are used to. Um, it's not to say that guys that went to those colleges cannot be successful out here, but I think that they just need to be prepared and know this is a different experience from college. Do not expect it to be like college. How sustainable is living off overseas football check? Like what were you able to live like? (laughs) 
Um, the thing is, when you play football in Europe, or in my experience, and this is actually from I, I know what it's like at basically all teams and leagues, is um, you are not – you are getting – a lot of the necessities taken care of your housing. A lot of times you'll have meals. Like, so for example, with the unicorns, we had meals at restaurants, we had a meal plan and we had access to a car with a few other benefits. Your insurance is taken care of. And then you get a small amount of money on top of that. If you say the amount of money that you're getting, it's laughable. But when you add up the value of all the other things, like, Hey, okay, my apartment was paid for. That's probably 500 to 700 euros a month. The, uh, the car that I use is paid for. Maybe that's another 200 euros a month. My insurance is paid for. That's another 250, 300 euros a month. Uh, I get these meals, 14 meals a week. That's another, I don't know, what, man, 500 euros a month worth of value. And then on top of that, you get what I would call a stipend. Um, I would say it can be... High, high-ish three figures to low four figures. These are the types of con, uh, checks we're talking about. But it's so different because like us unicorns imports, we got paid a low amount on a stipend compared to other GFL teams and other, other teams. But we had a really good system of other benefits, apartment, car, and the meal plan was very great. So, uh, the overall value of ours is fine. So no, it is not sustainable. It'll keep you alive. You're not going to be able to save money. Um, but you will have, if you're open to it, an incredible experience and you can, you know, you have so much time, maybe you can start something on the side. Um, but yeah, you're not going to get rich playing football in Germany or Europe. Not yet. We'll see you in a couple of years. Do you speak German when you're out alone in the city? Yeah, I mean, this is a small German town. Anytime I'm going out in the city and doing, um, doing whatever I need to do, I am speaking German. Do you worry about your cat back in Portland, and does she recognize you when you are back home? I worry about my cat, Leo, but my uh, mom sends me pictures of him a lot, and yes, of course, he recognizes me. Actually, I do have a, a girl cat too, Mia. She, I feel like she doesn't recognize me as much or really care about me, but Leo does. And I really cherish our relationship. I love, I love that guy. I love that cat. Do you find your Americanness is more pronounced when you are in Germany or in, in the U S my Americanness is much more pronounced. Man, that's a good question because some things are more pronounced here, I would say. Like, I feel like I kind of stand out a little bit in the way that I dress. I mean, look, I'm wearing a USA shirt. Um, but when I'm, in the U when I'm in the USA, I turn on my, and this is kind of my natural state. I've had to learn not to do this in Germany. But like when I go out to the grocery store or to the the coffee shop or something. And I like, I have so many small little interactions with people like hold the door from me. Hey, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Get on here. What, what kind of coffee you grabbing? Blah, blah, blah. Or the small little interactions, small talk with people at the States that I turn off here because you don't do that here. Even, even like smiling at people and I'm walking around Schwabisch Hall and you know, I'm getting that German stare at me and I try and, you know, neutralize it by, Hey, smiling. People are really uncomfortable with that. Um, and so I've sort of neutralized my Americanness in that sense. But hmm. Yeah, that's difficult. That's a really good question. It's a really good question. I feel like I am probably more I'm more comfortable being my natural American self more often in the United States. In Germany, when you are your natural American self, um, it can cause for some uncomfortable situations. Worst bus ride in the GFL. Ooh, that is Marburg for sure. Away games at Marburg. Those games were typically Sundays too. And so, 
yeah, those were tough. I'm like four hours and just, ugh, those are brutal. What are your future plans? Stay in Germany? I am trying to figure that out. Right now I'm staying in Germany, at least the foreseeable future. I am, um, I would say, coming to the final stages of some job opportunities. Nothing is totally finalized yet, but uh, working on that, and then we will see. Question from Mike Gentili. When is Mike Gentili on again? Mike's going to be on the podcast again. We had a great time. People are seeming to like that podcast. It was a really good one. Despite Mike's personality, I was able to carry the podcast. <laughs> no, we'll get you on again there, Mikey G. If all the fields would happen to be another color other than green, what color would you choose? Ooh, like football fields or just natural grass fields? I feel like it would be cool to play on a blue field. Or if it wasn't in a hot area, a black field, that would be kind of cool. Why Oregon will always be superior to Oregon State? What a disgusting, stupid question. Oregon State is superior. Oregon sucks. I hate the Ducks. What is a memory you would want to relive from the past five years? Wow. I would... I really loved, looking back on it, the 2017-2018 years in Schleibischal. We were living up, up like in an industrial park. Not good apartments. Better than the horrible Ami house that they had us living in, but these are like not very good apartments, but it was a lot of us living together and we had two apartments close by to where all of us imports were right there and we had, um, you know, at, during this time, we would all go to the restaurant sponsors together and so we were always eating lunch and dinner together and we won the championship both of these years and looking back, back, I, those were two of my favorite years in Germany. And not to say that, not to say that, um, I don't love life in Germany right now and my life right now, but those were, there was something magical about those years and innocent and playful, I think. And I really cherish those. It's so weird because it's like, you never, this is that famous quote from The Office, the TV show The Office, the American version, where I said, I wish you could realize you're in the good old days before you actually leave them. Because I think back to those times, and I see them now through rose-colored glasses, but like when I'm in those times, I'm just thinking, oh, this is just my life. This isn't anything special. This is just my day-to-day -day life. And yeah, I'm going to lunch with, with my friends. Yeah, we're all going to dinner tonight at this, this burger restaurant. We're going to sit there for three hours and have a couple beers and talk and shoot the shit. And just, yeah, of course, this is just, this is just my life. But it's like, these are, uh, these are oftentimes such cherished memories. And I, I was able last night to actually tap into that in the present we all went out to Cody and Speedy's house. It was their daughter Viola's first birthday. And so it was a good handful of us that went out there. And it was a very cool evening, chill evening. We were all just hanging out, sitting on the floor, playing with the baby, all just joking around. And I felt like I was sitting there and I, and I was able to actively think to myself, this is going to be a cherished memory. And it is something that I'm kind of working on is recognizing that it, for some reason, us humans struggle to realize, like to really be present, or at least I do, to really be present and recognize when you are, you're, it's almost like this is like peak life. It's not to say that this is the top of my life and everything's downhill from there, but like this is close to like a peak experience of life. Um, and there's many, there's many moments like that that I'm trying now to recognize while I'm in them. It's like when I went sledding with Laura the other, the other week and like we hiked up and it was just gorgeous and we were just having fun and we had a butter pretzel up there and I'm sitting at the top of the mountain after we just hiked up and, and just thinking, this is a elite moment of life. Maybe not peak because peak implies that it's the top and there's nothing better, but 
elite as a category. This is an elite moment of life and experience. And I would say, I got off on a tangent there, but I feel like that's something I'm really trying to do more is to recognize when I am having, when I'm in such a great moment, because I feel like I'm really kind of a, I'm always going, going, going. I'm doing a lot of things. I have a lot of projects and I'm hustling all the time. Like I work seven days a week always. And I have for as long as I can remember, but so, so I'm sometimes catch myself being on autopilot or have caught myself being on autopilot. And that's where I'm trying to slow down, chill. This is why I work really hard. This is why I've, you know, done all this stuff is for like moments like this. And I think that's super important, but it's like, I didn't do that with those memories in 2017, 18. And so with the knowledge that I have now, I would I can picture myself sitting at the table at Southwestern when all 10 of us around the table after a football practice or whatever and think, this is an elite experience. As a former professional athlete, can you imagine trying out various non-professional German club sports? Yes. Um, You guys saw in my last video, maybe, that JoJo, Rudy, and Cody are playing on this basketball team. Actually, they have a game today. Uh, I'm thinking about joining that Um just got to get my health insurance in line first. And um, yeah, I would really like to do that. It's cool in Germany. You have like, for all levels of sports, you have pretty organized clubs. It's like, that's a, went to that basketball game and it's so structured and organized and it's a league and you have referees and official and there's people there watching and it's legit. And uh, um, excuse me, I think that's um, a really cool thing. Hotchkiss, <laughs> my good buddy Connor Bowling, one of my great friends from growing up. We met at the Hotchkiss School in Connecticut, and then we went to Georgetown together. <laughs> and he has given me some topics that uh, I am not going to talk about publicly. That's good. Miss you, Connor. He became a dad recently. Hey, Nick, is it hard not to play anymore? My time is coming up, and I am kind of afraid of it. Yeah, just like I mentioned earlier in the podcast, it is difficult, um, I would say, and I talked about this in my recent YouTube video. It's very much a transition period for me. Um, But on the other hand, it does open you up to other opportunities, I think. And it just, for me so far, it's just made me have to be more intentional about certain aspects camaraderie structure, but it's also given me more freedom, emotional bandwidth to apply to other things, such as starting this podcast. So I, there's pros and cons to it. And I just think that you should be prepared that it's going to be a period of change. And in, yeah, it's not just like, Hey, yeah, okay, I'm done playing now. And that's it. It's like, cause it's, if you play in football, it's a big part of your life probably. And so to know that it's going to be weird and different and you have to replace some things with others, um, but it's doable. And I would say, I don't know, I'm staying around the sport. Have you ever been to Maine? I've not been to Maine. I've been to New Hampshire and Vermont, but I've not been to Maine. Well, all right, guys. That looks like that's all the, the stuff that you guys gave for me on this, this little solo podcast. Um, really fun. like doing this. Of course, I love having the guests, and that'll be the majority of these. But every once in a while, I'm going to do these solo podcasts as well because I really enjoy just rambling and kind of being able to talk about, you know, whatever, whatever I feel like. There was something else that I felt like I really wanted to talk about. Hmm. No. Can't think of it. All right, guys, that's going to be it. Uh, Be on the lookout um, for more episodes from this podcast. I really enjoy doing it. I do appreciate everybody that's subscribed to this channel. I said I'm trying to get this channel to 1,000 subscribers. It's really fun for me to do this because it's crazy. My NALF channel has blown up bigger than I could ever imagine, and the views that those videos get, it is so cool and crazy, but it doesn't almost doesn't even feel real. 
And right now it's fun to be building a YouTube channel again from scratch. And so I appreciate you guys who are here, hopefully early and uh, supporting this channel. And uh, yeah. All right, guys, that's going to be it for the imported podcast today. Have a good one.